like you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Romans chapter 4. We're going to look in verse 1. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. Last time we were uh, together and we were teaching through uh, this understanding of Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 in the book of Romans. These three chapters are very misunderstood. Uh, they have, and they're the explanation of why God interrupted Israel's program for the dispensation of grace. And then what's going to happen at the end of this dispensation of grace with the rapture of the church and the body of Christ, God's going to resume Israel's program. So it's just a temporary interruption. We, we use the, when we fold the chart, it's helpful as a visual aid to see that Israel's program would have gone right into the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation period. And after seven years of great tribulation, the Lord would have come back, set up his kingdom, just like he promised in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the early part of the book of Acts, just like he promised that he was going to do. But God revealed a purpose that he had, a secret purpose, that we now know through Paul's writings as the dispensation of grace, in which God had a purpose to accomplish, to raise up the church, the body of Christ, which he's going to use after the rapture to reconcile the heavenly places. And there's explanation in all Paul's epistles about God's purpose for the church today, the body of Christ. But Romans chapter 4 explains something that we, uh, we encounter as we study Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. And that is that little flock of believers that were ready and prepared by the Lord in His earthly ministry to go through the tribulation period and into the kingdom promises of the, to the twelve of sitting on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel in that kingdom. It was just a few years away for them, but their program was interrupted. And the big question today is, who is Israel? The church today thinks the church, the body of Christ, the church of God's been forming for the last two thousand years through the preaching of the cross is good news. They think that the church, the body of Christ, is now the recipient of all the blessings God promised to the nation of Israel, except they're not actual literal physical blessings. They don't want to inherit Israel's land over there that God promised to Abraham, Israel's father. They don't want Palestine. What they want is they spiritualize that promise of the, of the, uh, the kingdom being the, the, maybe if you live in the United States, it's the United States. If you live in China is China. If you, whatever country you're in, you spiritualize all God's promises to Israel in time past and claim them as promises that God made with you and I today. The problem with that is God didn't promise those things to you and I today. He promised those things to Abraham's seed, the seed that had the faith of Abraham. Those were literal, physical uh, promises that were going to happen in a, in a land that the Lord Jesus Christ is literally reigning on the throne of David in Jerusalem. That, those promises are made to uh, Abraham's seed, the seed of Abraham. And we read about that in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. Is, there's no such thing in the Bible as spiritual Israel. God never says that he's given Israel's promises to the church today, the body of Christ. And if you read Romans through Philemon, You'll see it does not mention the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It doesn't mention all the, the things the Lord taught to Peter and the eleven about that coming kingdom. Those things aren't mentioned. It doesn't say that we're going to go through the time of great tribulation before uh, the Lord comes back to set up his kingdom. Those things are not given through Paul to the church, the body of Christ, as we've seen. In Romans 4, though, um, we saw that Abraham, uh, we're going to look at verse 1 about Abraham's salvation. And it says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now, that is a quote. What happens there in uh, Romans chapter 4 and verse 3, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness, is taken from Genesis chapter 15. Just 15 chapters from the beginning, the first uh, chapter of our Bible, we see God made a promise to Abraham, and it's called the Abrahamic covenant. He began that covenant, uh, that promise began in Genesis chapter 12, 
And in chapter 15, he reiterates or he, he re, reoffers the same promise, the, the Abrahamic covenant. And in Genesis chapter 15, it tells us, uh, verse 5, And he brought Abraham forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven. God brought Abraham and he told him to look up into the sky, look toward the heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto Abraham, So shall thy seed be. Now, Abraham and Sarah were 80 some odd years old at this point, and they had never had a child. And the problem turns out to be Sarah was barren. She could not have a child. But God's promising a child, and Abraham, instead of looking to his flesh and, a and Sarah's flesh and say, well, that's impossible. We've tried for years, and this didn't, you know, didn't happen. He believes God, God's promise. Now, this promise that he gave to Abraham involves more than just Abraham having a bunch of kids. This is God's purpose and plan forming the nation of Israel. Abraham and Sarah were Syrian Gentiles. They weren't Jews. They, the nation that comes out of them, the seed that they have, ultimately is where the seed line of the Lord Jesus Christ comes from or through. And it was God was looking toward the Lord Jesus Christ paying for the sins of all his creation and that was what God saw in his promise to Abraham. In thy, it, look, count the stars if you're able to, but I'm going to bless your seed as the number of those stars. Abraham believed God, it says in verse 6, and he believed in the Lord. And that's the key here. He believed in the Lord. And he counted, the Lord counted it to him for righteousness. That is salvation. Different times the gospel message changes throughout the Bible. But the main issue is believing in the Lord's promise concerning eternal life, concerning the sin problem that we have, and believing what God says we need to trust in to receive eternal life. Right now it's trusting Christ died to pay for our sins. So look at back in Romans 4. Look at verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, the issue there is eternal life. It's clear Abraham is used as an example of eternal life for us in this dispensation of grace. But he uses Abraham as an example, and that's why he says that Abraham is the father of all them that believe. There are Christians today, like we talked about earlier, that say, see, we're spiritual Israel. God took all Israel's physical blessings promised from Abraham and Moses and all the prophets in the Old Testament, and he's given them to the church, the body of Christ today, and they're not literal promises to, to the nation of Israel. The Israel, because they crucified their Messiah, God judged them and taking away all their promises and giving them to us. So the problem with that is Paul uses Abraham as an example of the father of all them that believe and there is a believing remnant back here that did not crucify their Messiah. That believing remnant were those that hoped that he would be king at the time in his earthly ministry when he presented himself to Israel as their Messiah and they were devastated when he was crucified by though that that portion of Israel that was apostate, unbelieving. Satan basically enters Judas and helps accomplish that. Uh, Israel's leadership, the Pharisees, they have a mock trial. You know the whole story about all that. That was apostate Israel working. That wasn't the believing remnant, the little flock of believers. That wasn't the part of Israel that God looks at as saved. Um, the believing remnant is, is the term that I was looking for. The believing remnant in, in Israel inherited all the promises the Lord promised to them, but, the, but God set the nation aside uh, in, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, the martyr, looks up to heaven and he says, I see the Lord standing at the Father's right hand. And that was a position of coming in judgment. It was a position that he's going to have when he comes back and judges the world over here. And after that is when the Lord appears to Saul on the road to uh, Damascus and reveals his purpose to interrupt Israel's prophetic program for the present dispensation of grace. So, uh, if you're back in uh, Romans 4, verse 6, But even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputed righteousness without works, saying, 
Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Isn't that a blessing to know today that when you die, heaven is going to be your home because you trusted Christ died to pay for your sins. And the moment you did, God identified you together with Christ. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So our sins are under the blood of Christ. We know that God, when he sees us, he sees his son's perfect righteousness. We are accepted in the beloved, uh, Ephesians chapter 1. So, <clears throat> like David said, um, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, works, saying, verse 7, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Do you remember David was involved in, in a situation where he coveted uh, Uriah's wife, Bathsheba? He wanted her to be his wife, but there was a problem. She was married to Uriah. So David sinned, and as a result, to try to cover the consequences that happened, uh, Bathsheba became with child. Uh, David tried to cover that by just uh, sending, uh, asking Uriah to go back into the battle and expecting him to die in battle. And then David sent a note with Uriah to go back, gave it to his captain, and that note said to advance in battle, but then withdraw your troops and let Uriah die, perish in the battle. And, but David says, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Was the sin of murder and adultery, was that something that you could commit under the law and continue to go on in life with forgiveness from God? Not continue physical life to continue. You'd be cut off in Israel's law program. A murderer, somebody that had accomplished adultery and murder, those things, uh, they're under the law, they were to be judged by their peers and put to death. David receives this forgiveness from God. God forgives David. He approaches David about it. You know the story. And David admits to his guilt, and God forgives him. The baby that uh, they, uh, he and Bathsheba had, that baby, did die, uh, was ill and died. And, uh, but, but then David went on and, and had several other children by Bathsheba. One was Solomon. So it was a sin, don't get me wrong. But Christ died to pay for that sin. And in this case, God made an exception for David. And David understood what it was to have your sins forgiven. Uh, verse 8, blessed is the man to whom God will not impute sin. Verse 9, cometh this blessed this, that, that he's talking about, David upon David and upon Abraham, to believe God and have it counted to them for righteousness. Cometh uh, this blessedness, verse 9, then upon the circumcision only, and that would be after Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, God gave him a, uh, he, he told him he'd like him and all his seed to circumcise the male children in Israel on the eighth day. And so Paul asked the question, cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only? Circumcision became the term that we, that in the Bible, it refers to the nation of Israel as the circumcision. And cometh this uh, blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision. The uncircumcision is the rest of the world, the Gentiles. Does it, uh, did God promise uh, impute righteousness and the forgiveness of sins to just Israel? Did God have a plan when Christ went to the cross for just Israel to receive the forgiveness of their sins and be able to inherit the land as an everlasting possession and be made that righteous nation only? Now, of course, through the revelation given to Paul, we now know, he says, for we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned, he asked the question, when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? And it was prior to being circumcised, so it was in uncircumcision. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Verse 11, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised that he might be the father of who? All them that believe, though they be not circumcised, 
that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Who's Paul? Paul is the, uh, the apostle of the Gentiles. He's the apostle that God interrupted Israel's program and revealed some truth to that God was extending the opportunity to the whole world, not just Israel, but to all the nations to trust that Christ died to pay for their sins and be saved just by trusting that Christ died to pay for your sins individually. And so he's, Paul says here that Abraham was justified before he was circumcised that he would be the father of all them that believe in all God's programs. Now, verse 11 says, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith with which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision. Now, they're, they're, this is talking about Israel, the prophetic program. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had yet being uncircumcised. Now, you got to understand, if you were a child of Abraham, if you were one of the 12 tribes that were born out of Jacob, and you were circumcised when, when you were eight days old, if you're a boy in, in Israel, that alone wouldn't save you. What you needed to do in your lifetime, like any other son or daughter of Adam, is you needed to realize you're a sinner who needs to trust in God for his mercy to save you. And that's what Paul's pointing out. God didn't reckon Israel, that the believing remnant, the election of grace, the little flock, that righteous nation, the Israel of God, God didn't set them aside. They are seated with God in heaven right now. They, they died out and they're, they're with the Lord. Um, Abraham's bosom was transferred to the third heaven. They're in heaven and they're waiting for God to finish with the program and the, and the purpose he has with the church today and resume their prophetic program and purpose that he's going to come at his second coming. There's going to be a resurrection of all those saints in time past that believe God. And they're going to go into the kingdom with those that are alive and remain in the tribulation period that survive into the end and walk into the kingdom. So there's going to be that. That's their hope. Different hope than our hope. Look at uh, verse 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So that's Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. The issue with Abraham that it was proven with Abraham is there wasn't anything Abraham had done, but believe God's promise to him to be made righteous. Okay, so for the promise that he should be the heir of the world. Now, remember, that promise is significant. We're going to read about it. In Romans chapter 9, in just a minute, the promise. I want you to remember that. The promise that we get as children of Abraham is eternal life. We're not going to receive the physical promises of the, the great uh, population of people that are the nation of Israel, that are going to receive that land promise that God gave the boundaries to Abraham that encompasses all of Palestine, as we know it today, the whole land of Canaan. Uh, all the way down to the river of Egypt, all the way up to the, the boundary is, is the Euphrates River, all the way over to Iran and Iraq. That whole area is going to be Israel's promised land that God is going to give them. That's not our promise. The promise that he made to Abraham is eternal life that we get in on, that Paul's talking about here. Uh, the righteousness of faith. Righteousness of faith is believing God's promise. For us today, it's the promise of uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Eternal life is a free gift from God, right? And that's, a gift comes by promise. A promise isn't, you don't receive a promise because you work 40 hours, and you don't get the promise of a check because it was just promised to you. You get it because you work 40 hours, wages, right? There's a difference between a gift and a promise. A promise is a gift, and wages is, is a debt. Verse 14, For if they which are of the law be heirs, doing works, performing the law, faith is made void, and the promise is made of none effect. 
So the promise God made to Abraham was before God gave the law through Moses 400 years later. So the promise given to Abraham and all the seed after him who not only walked, were, uh, lived under the law, but also walked in the steps of their father Abraham, believed God and trusted him for eternal life, that law was added until the seed should come to whom the promise was made, Christ. Israel had that many years after uh, Abraham until the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross that as a nation they were going to fail under God's law program and they were going to end up, end up carried away into captivity. But God promised that Israel, told Moses in fact, that Israel would fail under the law program. And, and it would result in them being under curses because they would be behaving just like the Gentiles that God drove out of the land before them, right? So God kicked all these Gentiles out of the land to, to allow Israel to possess it, but Israel becomes more sinful than what the nations that were in the land before them were. They not only practiced the law of one of those countries that were driven out, they practiced idolatry of all the gods of all the nations that were there before them. So they had a multiple gods that they were worshiping. He says in verse 14, For if they which were of the law be heirs, keeping the law, doing the works of the law, would, then faith is made void, and the promise is made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, and where no law is, there is no transgression. Verse 16, Therefore it is of faith, that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, Israel under the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is what? The father of us all. So the righteousness of faith, believing God and it being counted to, to a believer for righteousness, that's the issue. Let's go to Romans 11 verse 1. Now this is what we've been studying. Romans 11 1. I'm sorry. Um, this section, we're going to read from verse 4 down to verse 8 in Romans 11. But what saith the answer of God to him? So Elijah, remember we talked about Elijah the prophet. He thought he was the last believer in Israel. And, and uh, Ahab's wife Jezebel was after him, said that she was to kill him because Elijah had had the prophets of Baal killed. Verse 4, what saith the answer of God to Abraham? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. These are men that believed in God. They were trusting in God, and God had counted it to them for righteousness. In the next verse, there's a name for these believers who hadn't bowed the knee to the image of Baal. He said, even then at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace that's believing God and having it counted to them for righteousness. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, be otherwise work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Uh, so that, there's your point here. The election, the believing remnant that the Lord, all the thousands that were at the feast that the Lord uh, had the multitudes he was preaching to on the mountain. They had no food with them. He'd ask the disciples how much food they had to feed the, the multitude. They'd say, we have a few fish and a couple loaves. And what, is, what does the Lord do? He makes that enough to feed the whole multitude. Those thousands that were following the Lord that were saved and the thousands under Peter and the eleven's ministry and, and between uh, Acts chapter 1 and 7, they get saved. All those thousands are what the passage refers to is the election of grace. And verse 5, you see that, the remnant according to the election of grace. Verse 7, uh, Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. God set Israel aside temporarily until the end of this dispensation of grace. But the election of faith, they received the eternal life that, that was theirs because they believed God and God had counted it to them for righteousness. Okay, so go to Genesis chapter 17. Now, <clears throat> the Abrahamic covenant, we're talking about the covenant being a token. Genesis 17. I want to ask you, we, we read Romans chapter 4, and we saw that Abraham believed God. We went to Genesis 15, Abraham believed God, and God counted it to him for righteousness. My question for you this morning is, can you believe what Abraham believed? To be saved today. You remember what Abraham was told, look at the sky. If you, if you, 
I'm going to make your seed as the number of the stars in the heavens. You can't just go back in the Bible and pick any promise that God made back here and, and say, I believe that for my salvation. I believe that for a promise from God. I claim that to be one of my promises. God didn't make that promise with you. That was a promise that he made with Abraham. So um, was Abraham's salvation from what we read back there, was it based on him being circumcised? Did Abraham, did God save Abraham because he was physically circumcised? No, it was based on Abraham believing God and God counting it to him for righteousness. So we've, we've seen that. I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 33 now. Exodus 33. And look at verse 12. Now this, the context is the law. God gives the law to Israel on Mount Sinai. Moses goes up into the, uh, into Mount Sinai and God talks with him there. Moses had gone down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments and Israel was sinning. They, they had made the golden calf and Moses cast down the tablets, right? Moses ends up going back up into the mountain to make an appeal for Israel that God would not give up on Israel despite the fact they were committing Baal worship while he was up there receiving the law from God. Moses uh, said unto the Lord, verse 12, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom, whom thou will send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, and that I may find grace in, I, in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. God told Moses before he, Moses pleads with him that instead of his presence going before in Israel and that pillar of smoke by day and the pillar of fire by night, he would send an angel to go before Israel instead because he could not tolerate the stiff-necked, sinful people. They were, uh, they were uh, murmuring against God. They weren't happy with being brought out of Egypt. They wanted to go back to Egypt. That group, and God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to send one of my angels to go because I can't stay with you, uh, Moses. And Moses pleads with God, you said that I found grace in your sight. Go with the nation of Israel. And look what he says in verse 17. And God said to Moses, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Now, if you think about it, what was he talking about, his presence going with Israel? Well, it has to do with that column of, of smoke by day and the pillar of fire by night. But it also has to do with God's glory filling the tabernacle, didn't it? God's glory was in the tabernacle. And you remember when they went into battle? What did they carry into battle with them? They carried the Ark of the Covenant. The priests would carry the Ark of the Covenant in. And, and so the Gentiles just believed it was that Ark of the Covenant. That was Israel's power. And if we can just steal that Ark of the Covenant away from Israel, we'll have their source of power. They made movies about it, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, the idea was if we can find the Ark of the Covenant, we'll have the power of God. And we'll be able to use that as a weapon to defeat all the other nations. Well, what happened to the Philistines when they got a hold of the Ark? Did that help them? No, well, they put it in the, in the tent where their gods were set up and their gods had fallen down prone and it broke their hand, the god's hands off and their head off when it fell down before the Ark of the Covenant. Now, that was just God demonstrating to, to the Philistines, no, the power is not just having this box, the Ark of the Covenant, that contained the tablets, the golden box, gold-covered box. So Moses says, um, God tells Moses what Moses wanted to hear. My presence shall go with thee. I'm not going to send an angel. I'm going to be personally with you. My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. What do you think God meant when he told Moses he had found grace in, in his sight? Do you think it was the same thing that he meant when he told Abraham it, that God counted it to him for righteousness when he believed God? I think it's the same thing. Right. So Moses had believed God, God knew he was faithful, and he had found grace in God's sight, grace, salvation. He had given Moses his righteousness. And he tells Moses, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Isn't it amazing to know, know that God's presence indwells the tabernacles of our bodies? We don't just have to go to a temple in, say, the chief city of, of America, we don't have to go to New York or wherever the temple might be once a year to be able to experience the, the glory of God in the temple. 
and be able to worship God. God's temple is the tabernacle of our bodies. He indwells us the moment we trusted the gospel, in whom you also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We're sealed. God the Holy Spirit were identified, identified us when we trusted the gospel with the Lord Jesus Christ, and He sealed us in Christ the moment we trust the gospel. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. 